Christians, and by that expression I do not mean sombre Christians, but <laughs> Christians who take their faith and their being Christian seriously, serious Christians are, in my experience, very often anxious about two related things. On the one hand, there is an anxiety about our failures. We do not live up to what we perhaps think that a serious Christian should. On the other hand, there is a related anxiety about what we might be missing. Is there more to the Christian life than we have discovered? Responding rightly to these anxieties is not a simple matter. It would be foolish to simply dismiss them or to deal with them by some kind of denial or suppression, to cope by pretending that you are something that you know you are not, to overcome the anxiety with a smug kind of determined complacent self-satisfaction, or worse still, cynicism. But while some of us may well need to be warned not to shrug off these real concerns, we also need to understand that another danger is to seek relief or to seek answers somewhere other than in the gospel that we have received. Jesus, the Lord, the Christ. You remember Paul's counsel that we heard in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, what we could call the theme sentence of this letter. As therefore you received the Christ, Jesus, the Lord, walk in him, having taken root and being built up in him, and being established in the faith just as you were taught. And you remember how Paul spoke in chapter 1, verse 23, of not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. And remember how Paul has insisted that his own energies have all been directed to this one task, chapter 1, verse 28. Him we proclaim, warning every person and teaching every person in all wisdom. And it is by this means that Paul expects to present every person perfect in Christ. And that is because he is the one, chapter 2, verse 3, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden. Now it seems to me that it calls for careful wisdom to distinguish between being built up in him, as Paul put it in chapter 2, verse 7, and being deceived by persuasive speech, of which he warned in chapter 2, verse 4. It is not necessarily a simple matter to tell whether you are discovering, chapter 2, verse 2, all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's secret Christ, or, chapter 2, verse 8, being taken captive through philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elements of the world, and not according to Christ, simply because the latter is a matter of deception. I presume that whenever Christian believers are deceived in the way in which Paul envisages in this letter, they think that they are growing in Christ. That, you see, is the deception. The teaching at this point consists of three truths about Christ, which are briefly stated in verses 9 and 10, and then expanded in verses 11 through to 15. The three truths I've summed up as, one, God in Christ, Two, you in Christ, and three, Christ over all. The first truth is briefly stated in verse 9 like this. Because in him all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now here is the enormous claim of the Christian gospel, simply stated. The God who had once dwelt in the tabernacle, subsequently in the Jerusalem temple, the God who was pleased to dwell on Mount Zion, in other words, the God who had made himself known and who had made himself present among his people in the history of Israel, now dwells bodily 
in Jesus Christ. Paul is picking up what he's already said in that grand Christ passage in chapter 1 verse 19, in him all the fullness was pleased to dwell. And he is reiterating this radical claim. Now do remember that it was the Jewish Paul who was writing to the Gentile Colossians. And he didn't allow any notion that Jesus was a divine figure or that something of divinity was present in him. Certainly not that he was one among many religious figures. All the fullness of deity means that there is no more of deity to be found elsewhere. The idea of God dwelling should remind us of the Old Testament language of God's name, dwelling in the place that the Lord God chose. That reality whereby God was present by his name in the land, in the tabernacle, in the temple, on Zion, has given way to this reality where all the fullness of deity dwells bodily in Christ Jesus. The glory of God, the power of God, the love of God, all the treasures of the wisdom and knowledge of God, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily in Christ Jesus. The words in him, you see, speak of the absolute uniqueness of Christ Jesus. In our time, as in the first century, the claim must be made in the face of numerous rival religious claims. And the exclusive nature of this claim must be appreciated. It is not that deity is the kind of thing that one might encounter in various ways and to varying degrees in a variety of religions and, and spiritualities. No, the gospel claim is that all the fullness of deity, all there is to deity, is to be found in Jesus Christ. Moreover, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily in him. This is, this is real, this is substantial, it's even tangible and visible. All the fullness of deity has chosen to be present in this created world, not just in the general sense of what we sometimes call omnipresence, but in bodily form in Jesus Christ. It's physical. This is what was said earlier in the words, he is the image of the invisible God. Now, we have to wait till we get to verse 14, which I do hope we'll manage to do this morning, to see the purpose of all the fullness of deity dwelling bodily in him. But the first basic truth briefly stated for us in verse 9 should make us firm and clear that any philosophy or tradition that is not centred on Jesus Christ, that is not satisfied with Jesus Christ, will be an empty deceit, no matter how plausible. And that is why Paul struggles with all the energy that God gives him to proclaim Christ. That is why we must walk in him. We must be built up in him. The second truth about Christ briefly stated, that is briefly stated by Paul, not by me, in verse 10 again is, and in him you are filled. Uh, the TNIV puts it, in Christ you have been brought to fullness. Uh, the Revised English Bible, in him you have been brought to fulfilment. Uh, these are various attempts to get across the sense of the Greek tenses here. The point being that Paul is not speaking here about some future possibility. He is not talking about some unrealized ideal. This is a reality we can look at, so to speak. We can talk about, in him you are filled. Now what does he mean, you are filled? Well, in the context he seems to be saying, you are filled with the fullness of God. Now, that is what happens if you are in Christ, you see. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and in him you are filled. Now this is not easy to take in, and the briefly stated truth will be unpacked wonderfully for us at some length in verses 11 through to 13. But the brief statement is enough for us to see why we must, why we must take care not to be taken in by any ideas that would move us from Christ. Christ. 
or would move us on from Christ, no matter how persuasive or impressive. The third truth about Christ, very briefly stated here, is that Christ is the one, end of verse 10, who is the head of all rule and authority. Uh, again, what this means will be unpacked in verse 15, uh, but already we must see that there is no power, there is no authority that is independent of Christ or that is not under Christ. Any philosophy, therefore, or tradition or values or insights or experiences or spirituality that is not actually according to Christ is a delusion and a deceit. Now, these three briefly stated truths, God in Christ, you in Christ, and Christ over all, are not simply elements of, a, of an abstract philosophy or a theology of that kind. They are the historical realities of the gospel that you have heard. And so now Paul unpacks the reality of these three truths, taking the second one first and dealing with it at greatest length. In him you are filled, he has said. What does that mean? Well, he gives us a brilliant three-part description of what has happened to us in Christ. The first part is this, verse 11. In whom also you were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, in the putting off of the body of flesh, in the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in the baptism. Now Paul does not, in my opinion, mean here the Christian practice of baptism in water. He's talking about the reality. Do you remember how Jesus referred to his coming death as the baptism with which I am baptized? The baptism is the death of Jesus Christ, an event of such powerful significance, and more on that in a moment, that we, with him, have put off the body of flesh. As Paul argues more fully elsewhere, uh, in particular Romans chapter 6, we who trust in Christ have died with him, we've been buried with him. This is our circumcision, you see. Not a physical circumcision, but as Paul says, a circumcision made without hands, and not something that we do uh, or we do by ourselves. We are circumcised, he says, in the circumcision of Christ. That is, again, in the death of Christ. Why Paul chose to use the astonishing imagery of circumcision to describe what has happened to us in the death of Jesus, I think we can only guess. And, of course, the commentators delight to do so. But best, better than guessing why is appreciating what Paul is teaching us here. As always, Paul's thinking is deeply informed by the Old Testament. Circumcision there was the mark of being the people of God, given, you recall, to Abraham and his descendants, Genesis 17. As far as the descendants of Abraham were concerned, as far as Israel was concerned, the human race had two parts the circumcised and the uncircumcised, Israel and the nations. The wonder now is that there in Colossae, and indeed wherever the word of the truth of the gospel was being proclaimed, in the whole world, people from the nations were now being circumcised in this remarkable new kind of circumcision. Here is the powerful significance of Jesus' death, even for Gentiles like us. Christ's death was so fully and effectively for us that we have to say that what happened to Christ in awful, physical, bloody reality, his terrible circumcision, has happened to me in reality too, though not physical and bloody. I've been circumcised. The death of Jesus for us is something that I fear has become a bit of a cliche in many Christian circles. One benefit perhaps of Paul's stark and graphic language here may be to help us to break through the cliches. 
we are to consider the death of Christ, that astonishing baptism, his circumcision, and understand that there this extraordinary thing happened to us. Our old life came to an end. The necessary consequences of this will come later in Paul's letter. Just glance across if you've got your Bible open to chapter 3 verse 5. Read how he will say, Put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On, the, on account of these things the wrath of God is coming. In these two you once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. You've put them off, you see, because you were circumcised in the circumcision of Christ. Now this is a big part of what Paul meant when he said, in him you are filled. But it's not all. To die with Christ is no more the end of our story than the death of Christ was the end of his story. The second part of the description of what has happened to us in Christ is like this. It's in uh, verse 12, I'm picking it up. In, him also, sorry, in whom also you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him. You Gentiles used to be dead men and women. The controlling pattern of your life and your existence such as it was, was trespasses. It was false, it was wrong. You were in every sense uncircumcised, lost, as Paul says here, dead. And in a slight confusing but a rather stark way of putting it, we need to understand that it was that dead existence that died with Christ. Your uncircumcision was circumcised. Your flesh-controlled being was put off in Christ's death. And so just as really as Christ was raised from the death, dead, so you were raised with him. You were made alive with him. Now you might want to say, yes, I hear these words, but where is the reality? Where is this new life? What is this new life? Here I am in my old body. There are you in your slightly younger bodies. <laughs> it's not obvious that anything has happened, that anything has changed, is it? Oh, yes, it is, Paul would reply. Your faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead, verse 12, is the sure sign of new life. Just as it is the means of taking hold of that new life, it's the breath of this new life. Your faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead will animate a whole new life as new and as substantial as the resurrection life of Jesus. Do you remember how it was that the news of these Colossians' faith in Christ Jesus stirred Paul to his constant faith, uh, thankfulness back in chapter 1, verse 3? It was continuing in this faith, stable and steadfast, that was more important than anything else in chapter 1, verse 23. It was the firmness of their faith in Christ that gave Paul such joy in chapter 2, verse 5. And it was this faith that he called them to be established in, in chapter 2, verse 7. Your faith, your faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead is the breath of your new life. The third and briefest part of the description that takes us to the beating heart of what has happened to us in Christ is at the end of verse 13, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Don't overlook the word all. 
the heart of the new life we have been given is the forgiveness of all the trespasses. Because, of course, the, essences of our, the essence of our old dead existence being discarded is the forgiveness of all our trespasses. It's just part of life that some of us are more aware of our trespasses, our sins, than others. Some of us have more sensitive consciences than others. But in Christ, the truth is this. All forgiven. All forgiven. Now I take it that what Paul has shown us in verses 11 through to 13 is what he meant in verse 10 by in him you are filled. I'm not sure what you are looking for in life. But what you should be looking for is what you have been given in Christ, in the death of Christ, in the resurrection of Christ. Verses 14 and 15, similarly but much more briefly, elaborate the other two truths about Christ that were briefly stated in verses 9 and 10, and they show us why in him we are filled. Verse 14 spells out the point of all the fullness of deity dwelling bodily in Christ. Verse 15 then spells out how it is that he is the head of all rule and authority. Just let, let us just look at this briefly. The point of all, full, the, all the fullness of deity dwelling bodily in Christ again lies in what was accomplished in his death. And it's spelled out in verse 14 like this, wiping clean the certificate of indebtedness against us with its legal demands which was opposed to us. And this he took from our midst, having nailed it to the cross. Just try and imagine a document that records in detail all that you owe to God. A full statement of your debt. What a disturbing document that would be. Wouldn't be brief, would it? If it's a certificate, it'd have to be a very big certificate or very small print, I think, or not, or something like that. But it's not the kind of certificate you'd want to frame and put on your wall for all to see. This is a document that you'd want to hide in a secret place where no one would find it, but the trouble is that the hiding of it wouldn't change the facts that were recorded on it. But you know what has happened, don't you? The certificate has been wiped clean, completely erased. The certificate that records in full detail all that you owe to God, the full statement of your debt, has nothing on it. That is what God in Christ has done in a rather beautiful mixture of images that doesn't quite work at a literal level, but who cares, the meaning is clear and wonderful. The certificate was wiped clean by being nailed to the cross. It was, of course, Jesus who was nailed to the cross. The certificate of indebtedness has been wiped clean by the debt being paid in full by his death. That is what God in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwelling bodily in him, has done. And then finally we are pointed to the cross yet once again in order to see how Christ is over all, the head of all rule and authority, verse 10. Verse 15, having stripped the rulers and authorities. He boldly made an example of them, having triumphed over them in it. I take it in the cross. I'm not sure that we need to be precise about what or who Paul means by the rulers and authorities. My suspicion is that the School of Theology coming out will sort that out for us fully and completely and finally and definitively. 
but I'm not doing so because you, you, you will understand I have very little idea what it, what it means. But, uh, and I take the usual course of saying, well, what does it matter? But earlier, you remember, he summed up the totality of all things in these words, things in heaven and things on earth, visible things, invisible things, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. In the cross, you see, all things have been put back in their place. And their place is under Christ. And insofar as they have usurped God's place, they've been stripped and put to shame. A mighty victory has been won over them. But don't miss the irony. The rulers and authorities most obvious in the first century Mediterranean world, namely the Romans, had put Jesus to death. They had no trouble doing it. They met no resistance. They suffered no injury. He was the one who was stripped naked. He was the one who was shamefully hung on the public gallows. The triumph, if you want to call it that, was all theirs. No, it wasn't. The truth is that the triumphant one was the one who died. And if you still cannot see that, then perhaps you'd better go back and read this passage carefully again. Let me conclude. Anxious Christian, I do not ask you to ignore your concerns about the inadequacies of your Christian life. But look to Christ. Consider again who he is. Consider again what he has done. And understand how in him you are filled.